Hey guys, welcome to part two of the restoration and upgrade of my Compact Desk Pro XL 466 computer. This is a 486DX266 machine that I picked up a little while ago for some retro gaming fun. If you haven't yet seen part one, go back and watch that for the initial exploration, cleanup, and the beginning of the restoration. In this video, we'll complete the restoration, give the machine some much needed gaming upgrades, and just get it looking and working the way I want it to for the years to come. This is going to be a long one, so let's go! Now before we get started, I don't ask for this very often, but if you do like my videos, be sure to click the like button below, and subscribe if you want. It really does help me out with YouTube's algorithms. By the end of part one, this system was cleaned up and working as designed, except for a dead soldered on CMOS battery and it even had a new Sound Blaster 16 card installed and configured. But in addition to the battery problem, it still had some issues with paint that was scratched and peeling off, it needed a new CD-ROM drive for gaming purposes, and while this is really an optional step, I also wanted to shut off its aging, whiny hard drive in favor of Compact Flash. I was also still a little unsure about the early Matrox MGA card, so I needed to do some more testing on that, We'll tackle all of that and more right now. First, the CMOS battery. After more than 25 years, it's given up all the electrons it can, which makes it necessary to reconfigure the system via the setup utility at every boot. Not cool. This machine shipped with a BR2335 lithium battery that's soldered onto the motherboard via three pins. This is a simple three volt coin battery that should be interchangeable with any number of others, the problem is just that it's not easily replaced, but we're going to fix that too. As always, I spent more time than necessary considering my options before settling on the most obvious. I ordered a CR2032 battery holder from DigiKey, a tall one to make sure clearance for any other motherboard components was not an issue, and I just bought a battery from my local Walgreens. Now, if you're not familiar with these batteries, the number just refers to the physical size, and as long as I'm putting in a battery holder, I can pick whatever size 3 volt coin battery I want. I think it makes sense to just pick the most common one with a similar capacity to the original. As for the prefix, well, the difference is the chemistry. BR batteries are a little more tolerant of high temperatures, but others with this system have used CR2032s successfully. If I need a BR2032, I can just order one, and we're making it a drop-in replacement. I carefully desoldered the original battery and pulled it out of the motherboard, which wasn't too difficult. The original battery had three legs, but two of them were on the positive terminal and were really just one big connection. The new battery holder has two legs, one positive and one negative, which is fine. I just left one hole empty. The distance between the pins on the holder was actually much closer to what the motherboard needed than I had measured. I had expected to have to bend the pins a bit more. But when I tried doing a dry run inserting the pins into the board, they just didn't fit. I tried cleaning any residual solder out of the holes in the board, but the pins in this holder were just too thick. I tried filing them down, but after about half an hour of this, ended up having to take a Dremel to them. And even with a burr grinder at 1700 RPM, it took me about 20 minutes to grind enough metal off these tiny little pins to get them in there. I didn't know they were making battery holder pins out of vibranium these days. Anyway, I finally got it installed, soldered it in place, reinstalled the motherboard, and attached everything to it, then fired the machine up. Here's the first boot. Obviously, I knew I'd still need to go through this once since it hadn't yet been able to save the configuration. I did that, and here's the second boot. Success! The machine now boots normally, and if the battery ever dies again, I can just pull it out and put in a fresh one. Task 1, done. This computer's already better than new. Now, onto the paint. I showed in the first video how damaged the case was, and while I've never painted a case before, this was just unacceptable. Something had to be done. Luckily there were no dents, bending, or physical damage to the metal, just the paint, so I thought that it was a project I could do. I'm a pretty handy guy around the house. Painting is not a foreign concept to me, although spray painting isn't something I'm all that used to. Before we get into the process itself, let's talk a little bit about the color of these old machines. 
and what I did to try to color match my Desk Pro XL. It used to be common to almost insultingly call the average PC beige. They were beige boxes. Apple used this to some effect when making fun of PCs in their late 90s marketing, though ironically they were one of the few companies whose computers actually were beige for quite some time. Hey, do you ever ask anybody what their favorite color is? I'm sure you have, or people have asked you. It's not the most interesting question. But how many times do you say beige? Never. Because it's, it's one of the worst colors. It's hardly even a color. It's like oatmeal or sand. There's nothing. It's beige. It's boring. It's bland. Now, computers, why in heaven's name have the people who've made computers before never done anything but beige? That's nuts. That's nuts. Have they been in thinking jail? That's crazy. See, most IBM-compatible PCs were actually light gray. That started with the original IBM PC, which was gray with an off-white face, and it continued all through the 80s and 90s. I feel like you can pretty easily see this in some of the ads I posted from that era in part one. Even on this degraded, scanned media, these machines usually look either off-white or gray unless they're under very warm light. Here's a Vogon's thread about this too, and they also figured this out. One guy there even had a Desk Pro EN, and he calculated its color to be an almost totally neutral gray. If you watch the movie The Terminal, this model is all over the place, and it sure looks gray there. But it is a newer model than the XL, so it could be a little different color. The problem I had is that the only photos I could find of the Desk Pro XL when new looked like they were shot under very warm light so it just looks orange no matter what. However, I did find one document that gives the color names Compaq used for their drives of that era. The dark color you see on my machine is clam gray, while the light color intended to match the case is beach gray, not beige. This didn't really help me that much though because I can't just run out and buy a rattle can of Compaq beach gray at the hardware store. And as we've seen, not all grays are 100% neutral, including gray paint. Most PCs also did yellow over time, some worse than others. So even machines that were originally gray now may look beige, or beige-ish. That may even be true for my Desk Pro XL, but it's hard to tell. One thing I can see is that the drive covers on my Desk Pro are very slightly different colors. You'll see later on too that the compact CD-ROM drive I bought leans much more towards the red than the greenish gray my Desk Pro's drive covers currently are, but this is a little later model and I'm not sure if it represents the exact colors that would have been in my Desk Pro. Or maybe that's what clam gray is really supposed to look like, I don't know. I also tried looking at whatever new photos of the Desk Pro XL that I could find, but the lighting is just too inconsistent among them, and some of them may have yellowed too. The long-winded point I'm making here is that in 2021, it's impossible to really know what the color of this machine is supposed to be absent some kind of official compact production document describing the content of their various grays. So I set out to just try to find a color that would work, something that looks right, whether or not it actually is. And I knew I'd never 100% color match the front of the case, which is unpainted plastic but I wanted a color that at least complemented it and gave the least amount of contrast. I took some photos with me to three different hardware stores and picked out three colors I thought might work. Ivory Bisque, Glacier Gray, and yes, Smoky Beige. Those were the most neutral off-white, the lightest gray, and the least brown beige I could find. I decided to test all of them on the case itself since you don't really know what paint's gonna look like until you put it on something and let it dry. I quickly masked the front of the case using some painter's tape and kitchen plastic wrap. I took the case outside and just sprayed a few spots. Don't worry about my graffiti tagger technique here, it's just a quick test. It seemed clear to me that one color was the immediate winner, but I also looked at it after drying for 24 hours. And yep, the winning color was... Smoky Beige. In certain light, it was hard to even tell where I'd painted it. If I were doing this in 1994 when this thing was new, I really doubt this color would have won out. But in 2021, with me trying to just match the computer's current look, it did. That glacier gray, by the way, was just too blue, as I had feared. I tried to remove the front face in order to fully paint the metal case, but I ran into a roadblock with these light extenders that run from the power supply to the front of the case. These are just for the power, drive activity, and network activity lights. 
I could not figure out how to detach these from the case without breaking them. I had hoped that when I got all the screws out, they'd just slide out from the front of the case, but they didn't budge. They're also stuck to the side of the case with a super strong adhesive, so they're not coming off the opposite way either. This seems like some kind of acrylic, and it's old, so I worried about brittleness and didn't want to force it. I decided to just properly mask up the front and leave it on. This time I used several layers of painter's tape to both mask and hold on to several more layers of a plastic drop cloth that I'd cut to fit the case. It ended up working like a charm. Best masking job I've ever done. I took the case back out to my backyard, sanded it down to rough it up, there's no real need to go down to bare metal, and got to painting. The paint I bought is that paint and primer in one stuff, so I didn't bother with a separate primer. I sprayed at least four, maybe five light coats, following the instructions on the can. Apologies for the cloudy video here. For the tests, I had wrapped the camera in plastic wrap for protection, but for the full painting, I had actually put a sandwich bag over it because it just seemed easier. I thought it was pretty genius at the time, but I guess the bag was not as clear as it looked. This paint has a satin finish, which I think is a little too shiny for a computer case, and is also really good at showing any flaws in your painting technique. So I waited a couple days and then sprayed four coats of a matte clear coat. I waited an hour or so to remove the masking. You really want to do that as soon as you can. Then a couple more days before really using the case. And voila. I think it turned out really well, and I'm quite happy with it. The beige is definitely a bit redder than the original color, which clearly is a little greenish, and probably always was. But it's pretty close, and the overall look is about a million percent better than it was. So a definite success. Job number two done. While I was waiting for the paint and clear coat to fully cure, I decided to check out the CD-ROM drive I'd ordered and received. This is a compact IDE CD-ROM drive, which I'd bought hoping to match the color of my floppy and other drive covers. Again, clam gray and all that. The seller labeled it as untested, which pro tip here means broken, but it only cost me five bucks and I figured if worse came to worse, five bucks just for that dark gray bezel probably wasn't a bad deal in itself. I could probably find another drive I could fit it on. But I had some confidence that I could probably fix whatever was wrong with the drive. CD-ROM drives are surprisingly robust. They don't break all that often, and when they do, it's usually one of only a few common and easily fixable things that go wrong. I hooked the drive up to the computer to test it. Unfortunately, I didn't film this part. And unsurprisingly, it didn't eject, though I could hear the motor whirring. So I sat down, opened it up, and sure enough, the eject motor belt had turned to goo. This is the worst way drive belts can fail, but luckily it's just a small one, so not too much to clean up and very easy to replace. I got back out my alcohol swabs and a couple of toothpicks and cleaned all of the sticky belt residue off the drive and take-up wheels, as well as the surrounding area, then I installed a new belt. I tested out the mechanism by hand and it seemed like everything was engaging and turning like it was supposed to. I did a little bit more light cleaning as long as I was inside the drive and then sealed it back up, making sure I left the drive tray open. The laser mechanism was in the open position and there's no easy way to get both it and the drive door in the closed position by hand, so best to just let the drive do it when powered on. Luckily I found someone still selling newly manufactured drive rails for older compacts on eBay, so I bought a couple sets just in case I ever do add a five and a quarter inch drive. This is another little annoyance I'd forgotten about on older PCs. You usually couldn't just screw drives right into the drive cage, even though they're all a standard size. Stock up on these while you can. I can't imagine producing these as a money-making business. I decided to try connecting both IDE devices I was planning to use, my CF card and CD-ROM drive, and then set them up more or less together to save some time. This is never a great idea with an old computer. When I first turned on the machine, the CD drive immediately sucked in the drive door and I could hear it looking for a disc. I pressed eject and it spat the door right back out. So good result there. Unfortunately, the computer initially did not want to cooperate with recognizing both devices. I swapped cables around, tried both devices individually, rechecked my jumper settings, reseated everything multiple times, 
And finally, the IDE interface seemed to just come alive. It eventually recognized both devices, and once it did, it was totally reliable. It did it every time from then on, with any cable. With both drives now at least recognized, I needed to actually get drivers for the CD-ROM loaded at boot time, which also meant setting up that CF card as a hard drive. Compact flash cards were sort of the original SSDs. They're commonly used in embedded devices for that purpose, and they're supposed to actually use the IDE standard, meaning all you should need is a cheap adapter like this to make one work. That's unless you have an original PC or XT class machine. You can watch my video on that too. Or, and this is a bit of foreshadowing here, unless your CF card or adapter actually isn't fully IDE compliant. In fact, this was the start of a whole bunch of problems for me. My original plan was to clone the SCSI drive to the CF card and run off that and I may still clone it one day just to preserve it, but I realized it was going to be a lot of effort for basically no benefit. All that drive has on it that's of interest to me is Windows 95, and it's Windows 95A, the initial release, and it seems to be a pretty cruft and crusted installation of it at this point. It also has multiple system folders, Windows 95 server and client folders, and other stuff that I don't think is needed, but that I also don't think I can just delete. It's about 450 megabytes worth of stuff, and that's with basically no interesting programs installed. So instead, I'll just be putting new installs of DOS and Windows on the card, then installing whatever software I want myself, either with a real CD or using a virtual machine on my modern desktop. Of course, I'll keep this SCSI drive physically in the computer, since it's not really a retro system without a whining, scratchy, spinning hard drive. But I'll still be turning it off unless I feel like showing it off to someone. First, I ended up installing DOS 6.22 to the CF card in a virtual machine on my modern PC because on the Desk Pro itself, the install disks just kept telling me the card was unusable. That was my fault. I forgot to use Disk Part to clean the card first. I ended up using this great guide, and I'll put a link to it in the description. I'd used this before for other projects, but just forgot how to do it, so I had to look at it again. After installing DOS, I also took the opportunity to copy over some Compact provided updates to my Desk Pro that had never been installed by the previous owners, including a newer ESA setup program, the CD-ROM drivers, and the final BIOS update from 1997. I then plugged the card into the Desk Pro and booted to DOS, which worked fine. Next task was to get the CD drivers loaded. With a Compact soft pack, that's literally this easy. Boom! It looks like nothing even happened, but it just created a folder and put the driver in it, then added the proper lines to the config sys and auto exec bat files. I tested out the drive by just installing Windows 95 to the card. Hey, guess that means the drive is working. Nice, a working CD-ROM drive with an uncommon color bezel for five bucks. I went to bed after testing out Windows, which ran fine, and when I woke up in the morning to try installing some other stuff, I got this. This is in a virtual machine, but it does the same thing on the real computer. I had actually rebooted and run Windows the night before, so this was a mystery to me. I tried using several different boot disks on both the real computer and the virtual machine and found while they'd boot fine and let me read from the card, nothing was able to write to it. I could still write to it from Windows 10 on my modern PC, but not from DOS. So my initial guess was that the Windows 95 launcher was trying to write something right at boot and couldn't. Luckily, or so I thought, I had another old CF card in another computer that didn't have anything critical on it, so I just went through the same process with it. It was basically a day wasted, but hey, this is just par for the course when adding things to an old computer. The computer as it originally was works fine now, but as soon as I start trying to do my own thing with it, it's just kind of a shit show of trial and error for a while. And same result. Actually, you caught me. This is actually the same footage, but it is from the second card. I had already wiped the first card again before getting a clip of it in its failure mode. This second card lasted four or five boots, but it eventually kicked the bucket too. So what's going on? Well, with both of these cards, I would get a 1740 error on boot. This clip is from the first card. This is a set block mode command error. But then I'd hit continue and they'd just work. I knew something wasn't right, but it didn't seem to affect anything until they catastrophically failed. 
My initial guess was that these cards just didn't fully support the IDE standard, including block mode, but that the PC must have been defaulting to single sector transfers as a failsafe. It's odd that it would work for a while and then suddenly not. Or maybe that was just coincidence and these cards are just at the end of their useful life. I have an industrial card in my original IBM PC for this reason, and I ordered another one for this machine now, which will be the third card I've tried. These are more reliable, more IDE compatible, and have much longer lifespans. In the meantime, I went back to the original SCSI spinner and decided to just install some stuff and run some tests there. After all, I still really wanted to try out some of my old CD-ROM games. I got tired of waiting, and I have a perfectly good hard drive. The first game I tried was the original Grand Theft Auto, and it just errored out. Well, I know that one runs in Windows too, so I'll just try it that way. I moved on to Great Naval Battles 3 and initially got an error about switching resolutions, but later it seemed to try to load but would then get stuck on this screen. I tried the original Fallout next just for the hell of it, even though it requires a Pentium 90, and I got the same message about resolutions, nothing about the processor. Hey, this is starting to seem like a pattern. It occurred to me that the MGA Impression Plus might not support Visa BIOS extensions. If you're not familiar or just forgot like I had, Visa BIOS extensions were a standardized interface that games could use to switch and access what were then considered high resolutions, 640x480 and above. Most later DOS games required these and I started thinking my Matrox card maybe just didn't have them. I downloaded UniVBE, which provides these extensions as a small resident program for a bunch of cards, ran it, and got this. Feel free to pause if you want to read the whole thing, but basically it's saying my card is old and slow and I should feel bad for owning one. So, hmm, about now I decided it may just be time to think about a different video card. It ran Doom okay and some earlier DOS games, but it hasn't done well with much else from the mid to late 90s. It's easy to forget, as I basically had, that in the DOS era you could not just take for granted that any graphics card could even work with every game. Every card seemed to have certain games it wouldn't run well or at all, as this great chart of DOS compatibility with early PCI and AGP graphics cards clearly shows. The Impression Plus definitely seems to have more red boxes on this chart than most, at least when it comes to later, more complex games. It doesn't seem to have the issues with jerky scrolling that the later Matrox cards had, at least, so that's something, I guess. You can also see on this chart that the Impression Plus is one of the only cards listed with no built-in VBE support. So there's your problem. I figured I'd try Fallout anyway. With UniVBE installed, it did run. Just not well. <laughs> Here. Good. I mean, it does technically require a Pentium 90, so what did I expect? Why am I even bothering? Why did I buy a 486 if I want to run Fallout? Well, wait for it. Wait for it. What's this? Why, it's a little taste of the bonus part 3 of this video series, is what it is. A little something I picked up after filming and editing most of part 1, so I've been saving it. Fallout actually has higher system requirements in DOS than Windows, and the Impression Plus is really more of a Windows accelerator than a DOS gaming card, so I figured I'd try the game in Windows too. Maybe it'll work better. It's a hybrid game with installers for both. And I just get a blue screen. You just heard my actual reaction at the time. All three of the games I initially tried that didn't work without UniVBE did work with it installed. At least in DOS. It's just too bad that everything that requires it runs like such ass. Granted, some of that's the fact that this is a 486, but I was running these games on a 486 DX250 in the late 90s and they ran okay. Better than this, at least. I do think Fallout convinced me to finally upgrade to a Pentium, but I got like halfway through the game before that point. I was running these on either a Millennium 2 or a Diamond Stealth by then, though, both of which are much faster graphics cards. Also, GTA still throws up a resolution error in Windows, and Fallout still blue screens. 
so some stuff still just doesn't work, especially in Windows. And yes, I have the latest drivers. So at this point, it seemed obvious to me that this card is not actually going to work for my purposes, and I decided to just order something else. But, you know, while we wait for that, let's take a look at and document what this card was really made for. On Vogons, I found a copy of the 3D Super Pack disc that would have originally shipped with the Impression Plus. Keep in mind that while it was very quickly surpassed, this was a combo 2D and 3D card in 1994, so it predates ATI's Rage series, S3's Verge, and obviously anything from 3DFX or NVIDIA. It even predates the launch of the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation. And it's a 3D card that came pre-installed in a 486 system. That's not something you see every day. I still think it deserves a little appreciation, despite its weakness as a general purpose gaming card. So just quickly, here's most of the stuff that came on that disc. This is Icehawk, a really bad futuristic arcade flight sim. Here's Sento, a really bad fighting game. This is supposed to be Spectre, but it just hangs my system on the title screen. I can't even control alt delete out of it. Well, this card is very slightly different than the Retail Impression Plus, so maybe it's got something to do with that. I don't think Compaq actually bundled this disc with this system. This is Renderware, which is actually the 3D development environment that the included games were made from. There are several demos that apparently show different types of 3D effects you can do. Here's Caligari's True Space, a 3D modeling and animation application similar to Maya, which I was using in class on an SGI Indigo 2 at the time. I had no idea Windows even had something like this in 1994. This is apparently not being hardware accelerated by the MGA. There's a note in the README file with this disk that the next version, out in only a few months, would be. But I don't think that disk was ever actually released, so I'm not sure if that version of True Space ever was either. I couldn't find it. It's a shame. This program runs pretty well just rendering on the 486, so I could imagine how much better it'd be with hardware acceleration. Obviously it's still using the MGA's excellent Windows acceleration to quickly draw the results of that rendering at 1024 by 768 What it's doing right now is not really any slower or less complex than what I saw on the Indigos we had in college, and I thought those computers were monsters. But this is the kind of application that DeskPro XL was really made for. And that's probably about the extent of what I want to do with my Impression Plus. I did run some actual DOS benchmarks on it and compared them to similar systems in Phil's Ultimate VGA benchmark database, and it's a horror show. 13.7 in 3D Bench 1.0C, and that should be more like 40. 10.3 FPS in Doom is about 15 FPS too low. 5.2 FPS in Quake isn't too far off, but it's still nothing to brag about. Most of these comparison systems had either S3 or Cirrus Logic graphics. And look at this, only 869 characters per millisecond in Landmark. A Millennium G200 on a 486 will do close to 14,000. So yeah, this card is just slow in DOS. So hey, look! I managed to find a new graphics card in 2021. Well, if I can't get an RTX 3070, I guess an S3 Verge will have to do. 
Seriously though, when you build a retro PC, there's a level in upgrading at which I think you do lose the point of what you were originally trying to do. And I wanted a 486 for some 1990s DOS and early Windows gaming. I have an Athlon XP system with a GeForce 4 for 2000s era Windows 98 and XP gaming. The temptation to upgrade everything until you've just got a more modern computer is strong, so I tried to stick with something period accurate, warts and all. The Verge chipset was introduced in 1995, so it's only a year removed from when my PC itself was produced. It makes sense as something I'd have actually put in this system at the time, and it's one of the most compatible and fastest DOS cards ever made. I did actually have a Diamond Stealth for a short time in the 90s, which was also a Verge-based card. The S3 I bought is a compact card, which keeps it in the family, but the main reasons I bought it were that it's actually the most compatible even among S3s, and it has VBE 2.0 instead of 1.2. It's a 2 megabyte card, that just means I can't run Windows in true color at 1024 by 768 which is not a big deal because it's still way too slow to run any games at that resolution and color depth. It looks to me like there's probably a daughter card that's meant to plug into these two connectors, and I'm guessing that would add either 2 or 4 megabytes. But I doubt I'd ever find one of these, and if I did, it'd probably be cheaper to just buy a whole other card. Verge cards only cost 15 or 20 bucks. I installed the card, turned my machine on, and it didn't even require me to run the setup utility. I did it manually later and the card was detected just fine and doesn't require a config file. I installed the last Windows 95 drivers for it, which took a few tries as things often did on Windows 95A, but it got it eventually. I then booted back into DOS, re-ran the same benchmarks and got much better results. Here are a few clips of them running. and a handy chart of my own to show you the improvement over the Impression Plus. Feel free to pause if you want to study that. The chart shows a relative share of 100% for each test. You can also just look at the raw numbers. Quake seems more CPU constrained than the other benchmarks, so the difference wasn't quite as dramatic there as the others. That'll be true of some games, probably especially simulation games like SimCity or Transport Tycoon. But 8.1 FPS is better than any other 486 on Phil's chart, so I'm happy. And here's Fallout running again. The intro actually works now. Ha! Ah, you're here. Good. We've got a problem. A big one. Getting into gameplay, still not great, but a lot better. This is honestly the way I played a big chunk of the game back when it was first released, on a 486 with a similar graphics card. Fallout was not an action game, so if it's a little slow, no big deal. Shit. So I'm going to call the graphics card sorted for now. I think this will work. Now let's just revisit the CF card situation. My industrial card arrived and this time I used disk part to clean it on my modern PC first, then partitioned it and installed DOS and Windows on the Desk Pro itself. Unfortunately I still got that same 1740 error, so I'm pretty confident now that the card is not the problem, at least not that problem. I used some Google Foo to refine my search about this, and I found some new information from people having very similar issues, and they solved it with a different card adapter. So I ordered the same one I saw someone else recommend, but this is going to have to wait. And it honestly can wait, because I also figured out the catastrophic failures. At least to the extent that I need to. So, Windows 95 gives an option to boot to a previous version of DOS if you previously had DOS installed. I rarely do that. DOS 7 that Windows is built on top of works fine for most things, but occasionally I'll boot to DOS 6.22 if something isn't working otherwise. One night I couldn't get the seventh guest to run. This was the first game I ever played on my 486, and it's an older CD-ROM title. So I tried booting into DOS 6. 
I immediately noticed while in DOS that Windows had renamed many of the files in my root folder with W40 extensions for Windows 4.0, which I'd also noticed on my previous two cards after they became unbootable. Sure enough, I tried booting back into Windows and the system hung. This was kind of a eureka moment when I realized that somehow booting to DOS 6 was causing Windows to lock up on the next reboot. I don't know if it's a bug in Windows 95 or still something with the card adapter, but it made me feel like it was probably fixable. I tried booting from a Windows 95 boot disk again and just executing a sysc command. And sure enough, despite the error message about an operating system mismatch, that fixed Windows, but it also broke the ability to boot to DOS 6.22. I then needed to boot from a DOS 6.22 boot disk and copy the system files over from it to restore that functionality. In the end, good is new, though it will happen again anytime I boot to DOS 6.22 from the CF card. So I probably just won't do that very much. So still not ideal, but now I know how to avoid the problem and how to fix it. Still don't know the actual cause, but sometimes just knowing the symptoms and the remedy are enough. Just to be clear, I can still boot to DOS 7 that comes with Windows 95. It works just as well as DOS 6.22 for most things. So it's not a big deal. As for the 1740 error, for now I'm just going to call that incomplete. But maybe the new adapter will fix it. A retro computer build is never done, and this is just one of those things that's going to remain in process. By the way, I mentioned that I wanted to switch off the SCSI drive, and here's what the computer sounds like after doing that. At this point, I've gotten so used to the hard drive sound that it's a little weird without it, but it's definitely quieter. Here's the original Close Combat, a game I've owned since its release and which doesn't work on modern 64-bit Windows. I love this game, and it was pretty revolutionary at the time, modeling real-time battles down to the individual soldier and their mental state, ammunition level, and more. It was really advanced AI, and still is. It's also got some amazing sound effects, which can be pretty brutal. I haven't played this in more than a decade, so I'm pretty happy about this. You can get this on GOG now. But I have the original CD, so why not just play it this way? If you think it's too slow, just wait until my next video. This probably isn't the graphics card holding it back. It's definitely a CPU intensive game. Well, it's about time to wrap this up for now. As mentioned earlier, no PC build is ever really done, and there's more I'd like to do for this one over time. But everything that was originally included with the PC is working, it looks a lot better than it did when I got it, and I made a few important upgrades to the stock config that make it easier to work with. I'll keep working on the CF card until it's 100% right. I also still want a better fan at some point. But all the required stuff is done, and I can now use this machine as a really capable mid-90s retro gaming PC. And despite the frustrations, it's been really fun to get to this point. Honestly, playing games is really only half the experience. Tinkering with stuff and figuring things out is a big part of what makes it satisfying and enjoyable, whether you're building a system yourself or buying something pre-built and adding to it. That's become kind of a lost experience on modern computers. We've become spoiled by standardization. So I hope this has inspired you to do the same. It's an adventure, and it doesn't have to be an expensive one, or at least not too expensive. Don't forget to watch for the bonus video coming up, in which I install and test something? If you've been paying attention at all, you probably know what, but for those of you who don't, just tune in and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Until then, I'll see you guys next time.